worshiping with us online, we value and are delighted that you join us in worship. Sabbath Church, this morning we worship under the theme, Dangerous Seductions. The great controversy between Christ and Satan will, so will close soon, and the wicked one is increasing his efforts to defeat the work of Christ for humanity. His aim is to hold people in darkness and rebellion until the Savior's sanctuary ministry is over. When people in the church are indifferent, Satan is not concerned. But when hearts unite, what must I do to be, sorry, when hearts inquire, what must I do to be saved? Is there to match his power against Christ and to counteract the Holy Spirit's influence? On one occasion, when the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan also came among them not to bow before the eternal king, but to carry forward his evil plans against the righteous. He is present when Christians gather to worship, working diligently to control the minds of the worshipers. As he sees the messenger of God studying the scriptures, he notices the subject to be presented. Then he uses his subtle skills and shrewdness so that the message may not reach those whom he is deceiving on that very point. The one who most needs the warning will be urged into some business trans transaction or will be prevented in some way from hearing the word. As we worship today, brethren, do not be deceived. We'll now have our song service. Happy Sabbath, church. It is truly a blessing for us to gather together in this fashion to worship God. Before we go into our song service, I'm going to ask Sister Lopez to pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come in your presence once more to give you all the honor and glory, I ask that you come by here, bless us, help us to receive your blessings today. In Jesus' name, amen. And we'll begin our song service with a beautiful prayer. I would be their savior, holy thine, teach me how. I would do thy will, O Lord, just thine. Help me, help me now. Hymn 308.
we must early seek the Savior. We must learn of him each day. We must follow in his footsteps and walk the narrow way. We'll sing hymn number three, 539. I will early seek the Savior. That's 539. unto the Lord. Him 515, the Lord is my light. Sabbath morning. So guess what? This is the first, the, the second verse. You're gonna sing it by yourself. So let's go. One, two, three. The Lord is my light to close me our eyes. Be stronger than sight. Looks up to the skies. Our Jesus forever in glory the three. Then how can I ever in darkness? Everybody together now. On the third verse, the Lord is my light, the Lord is my strength. I know in His might I'll conquer at night. My weakness and mercy He covers each part, and walking by faith He upholds me. Each Everybody sing. The Lord is my light, my joy and my song. My day.
Now, we'll stand and sing the opening hymn, 272, Give Me the Bible. That's hymn 272. your name. Father, we are thankful to you for the six days of toil and labor and for the privilege that you have afforded us that we can be in your courts and in your presence to worship and to glorify your name. Father, as we come, nothing in our hands we bring, but simply to the old rugged cross we are clinging this morning, pleading the blood of Jesus to forgive us and to wash us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because, Lord, we have not been the people that you would have wanted us to be during the course of this week. But thank you that you are such a merciful, forgiving, and compassionate Father that we are here this morning clothed in our rightful minds. We are still in the land of the living just to recognize how good and how great thou art. So, Father, as we come this morning, present to you the service of today, the first meal that is a Sabbath school. And we're asking your blessing upon the morning's proceeding, that whatever will be said and done this morning will be in keeping with your divine will. Lord, we ask that the presence of your Holy Spirit will pervade this place. More so, Lord, that your Holy Spirit presence will be in our hearts, in our midst, to break down whatever distraction, whatever idol, whatever that it may be and thrown upon our hearts this morning that will prevent us from seeing you afresh. Lord, we ask in a special way that you will, as your young people lead out, Lord, that they will be renewed. Their faith in you will be rekindled. Their love for you will be reignited. And Father, with such an army of youth, they will be empowered to go out there to work for you in the church so that as the 
so that as they work for you, the kingdom of Satan will be torn down and the kingdom of heaven will be raised up. Lord, bless us again. Bless the Sabbath school. Bless the teachers. Bless the song. Bless the poor. Bless those who are on their way coming. And Father, when we shall have come to the end of the Sabbath school, Lord, the first meal of the day, may we truly say, yes, Lord, our hearts have been blessed and we are satisfied. Take over now, and when all is said and done, may the glory, the honor, and the praise be given to you. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Just reminding you this morning that we are worshiping under the theme, Dangerous Seductions. Brethren, have you ever come to church totally committed to worship? You come and you're focusing on the song and everything. And then just something happened and your mind slip, And you're going back to the bills to be paid and the challenges you have faced. Right, Sister Carr? And the problem you had at school during the week. And worship is gone through the door and you forgot all about the fact that you were here to worship. So that is Satan's plan. Satan sees the Lord's servants burdened because of the darkness that surrounds the people. He hears their prayers for divine grace and power to break the spell of indifference and laziness. Then with renewed zeal, Satan tempts people to indulge their appetite or gratify themselves. And in this way, he dulls their perceptions so that they fail to hear the very thing they most need to learn. Satan knows that all who neglect to pray and read the Bible will be overcome by, by his attacks. So he invents every possible diversion to occupy the mind. His right-hand helpers are always active when God is at work. They will describe the most earnest, self-denying servants of Christ as deceived or deceivers. Their work is to misrepresent the motives of every noble deed, to spread doubts and arouse suspicion in the minds of the inexperienced. But we can easily see whose children they are, whose example they follow, and whose work they do. You will know them by their fruits. At this point, Sister Carr will give us the mission story. Happy Sabbath, family. There's a joke among us at work that after a while we are um, teaching the blind, we have to get glasses. My husband was asking if I need a pair of glasses to come up. So I just carried Joan my light in the event I'm up here and can't see the words. Because age has a thing of showing you up. All right, so the mission story is coming to us from Uzbekistan. My husband down there pronouncing it. All right, it is one of the two. My hair is getting real bad. Okay. So it is one of the two doubly landlocked countries in the world. A landlocked country completely surrounded by other landlocked countries. And there is what you call some story tips. It shows the location of Uzbekistan on the map. That's not what I want to share with us. Because we know when we give our 13th Sabbath offering, it is used to build churches around the globe. 
And as a child, I do recall where I would save up my little money because you want to participate in mission. I invite you to pray with me. Father, we come. We want the message that is hidden in this story to transform our lives. So we pray that the Holy Spirit will breathe on the written word and bring life to us in Jesus' name. So the story is told of Arthur, only five when he got baptized. He didn't know anything about God, and nobody brought him back to church after his baptism. Neither did anyone tell him, look like I won't be needing the light. Sorry for the destruction, Sister Gilfillian prayed about that. So neither did anyone take him back to church. Finally, he reached 14. You know, sometimes the children just whoops as if they passed through a certain age. And he was wearing a gold earring with a cross. Remember, after five, nobody told him about God, and they did not take him back to church. Then one day, he told his mother that he needed a guitar. Now, the storyteller said that this boy's life was just out of sort. And it is fitting that we are having Youth Day today. And we keep praying for our youth that they will have more of the desire for God. But let me stick to the story. Mother took him straight to a music store. Author's life needed some purpose, and she thought that getting this guitar would help him. He chose a brown electric guitar. At home, he found guitar lessons on YouTube and started trying to play. It wasn't easy. Pressing down on the strings hurt his fingers. But after a few days, the pain began to subside. His music, however, didn't sound anything like that of the YouTube chan um, teacher. Two weeks after getting the guitar, a string snapped. Otter didn't know how to change the string. So again, he looked online. He found the phone, num phone, phone number of someone named Aritom who offered guitar lessons. So he called. I need to change a string, he said. Can you help? Orthan said, Arthur gave Arthur his name, his address, number, and everything. The address sounded familiar. It turned out that, Arth that Orthan's father was the former boss of his mom. And so they got into contact. The next day, Orthan re replaced the guitar string. Afterward, he asked Arthur if he knew how to play. Arthur tried to show what he had learned on YouTube. But Orthan stopped him. Stop, stop. He said, you're playing the chords backward. Suddenly, Arthur understood why his music didn't sound at all like that of the teacher on YouTube. He hadn't been playing correctly. Arthur invited Arthur to guitar classes. At the first lesson, Ortham concentrated on the cross-shaped earring in Arthur's ear. Are you a Christian, he asked. Arthur said, I'm not a Christian. At the second lesson, Ortham suggested meeting the next time in a room at the local Seventh-day Adventist church. 
The church was close to Arthur's home and he agreed. As Arthur learned to play the guitar, he began to spend time with Arthur outside of the lessons. He learned that Ortham was global, a global mission pioneer, a missionary who shares the gospel with people in his own culture. He accepted invitation to go hiking with Ortham and other Adventists in the mountains. When the hikers sat down to rest, Ortham enjoyed listening to them sing songs. Autumn played along on his guitar. That summer, Arthur went on to Adventist youth retreat in another city. He was caught off guard when a retreat speaker asked the attendees to split into groups to pray. I'm an atheist, he said to the first person who offered to pray with him. The person went away. Let that sink in. Arthur also said that to the next person who came over that he didn't believe in God. Moreover, he added, I've never prayed before. This person didn't go away. We can fix that, he said. He taught Arthur to pray. That night, Arthur thought for a long time about what had taken place. On Sabbath, he was amazed to see a young man get baptized in the retreat. I was baptized when I was five, he said. Why do Adventists baptize adults? He learned that Adventists understand the Bible to teach that people should be old enough to understand the Bible and the commitment that they are making to God before being baptized. The next Sabbath, Arthur went to the Adventist church near to his home to worship for the first time. And amen is fitting right there. Amen. In the afternoon, he joined church members in handing out school supplies to needy children. He felt a new joy fill his heart, and he thought, what is the point of living if I don't help others? It was a turning point in his life. He no longer wanted to live an aimless existence he resolved to help others and to know God. Eight months have passed since Arthur started attending church regularly. He has been studying the Bible and he wants to give his heart to Jesus in baptism. He is glad that his guitar string broke. I believed in God because of a broken guitar string, he said. Part of your 13th Sabbath offering will help to open the first Seventh-day Adventist elementary school in that part of the vineyard. Father, we want to thank you that you have so many unusual ways of bringing others to know you. May we be found worthy that whenever we are called upon to do things that are unusual, we will just surrender our all, not knowing that you are turning the script around for someone to be saved in your kingdom. This is our asking, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Carr. You know, I could have lent her my glasses, brethren, but she didn't ask. But remember, we're worshiping under the theme, Dangerous Seductions. 
the less spiritual and self-denied doctrine presented, the greater the favor with which people receive them. Satan is ready to supply what people want, and he, and he palms off deception in the place of truth. This is how the papacy gained its power over the minds of so many. And by rejecting the truth because it involves a cross, Protestants are following the same path. All who study convenience and popular opinion so that they will not be out of step with the world will be left to receive destructive heresies in the place of truth. Those who look with horror on one deception will eagerly receive another. At this point, we're going to be having our lesson review by the teachers, but just before the teachers take over, we'll have the fosters with a special. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Multiply to 
right and grace was free oh, pardon there was floating light to be there my burden so found liberty at Calvary mercy there was great and grace was Please take over. together up yonder in a little while Will the circle be unbroken by and by Lord by and by There's a better home awaiting in the sky Lord in the sky Will the circle Unbroken by my Lord, by and by. There's a better home awaiting in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Well, I remember when I was alive, times I heard of things bad, but there's a silver lining behind every cloud. Just for people that saw the world trying to make a living on a black land. Circle singing loud Da da song Mama sang tenor Me and little brother will join her right in there Cause singing seems to have that troubled soul Now one of these days and it won't be long I will join them in a song We're gonna join that family circle life after all Will the circle be unbroken By and by Lord Welcome to our online lesson review. For those of us who would have joined us last week, uh, we have started a new quarter review, a new quarter lesson. And the topic for this week's, well, for this quarter's lesson is the great controversy. And we're at lesson number two. And the topic is the central issue, love or selfishness. But before we go into the actual review, just want to welcome those of you who are watching online. 
of course, even though you'll be seeing my face for the, for the remainder of the, of the review, I want you to participate as best as possible. So feel free to type any comments or questions in the chat or anything that you wish to contribute to our lesson review, feel free to type that in the chat so that we can have an interactive review as best as possible. So as we said, we're studying lesson number two. And for those of you, I hope you would have all studied. If you don't have access to our course, I invite you to probably go online and, and probably download one from the App Store, or you may just go in Google and type in SDA Court and you should be able to have access to the week's lesson. So without further ado, we'll go straight into our lesson. But before we do that, I'll invite you to assume an attitude of reference as we pray. Eternal Father and our God, we give you thanks for the study of your word. We pray, dear Lord, as we review the week's lesson that whatever lessons that are in there for us, that nothing will hinder it from touching our hearts and enable us to make a positive change and to lift us up spiritually. Bless all watching on this platform now and in the future. Continue to be with us, I pray. Amen. So as usual, the communication team will be assisting me with the PowerPoint. And so I'll ask them to bring it up as we open this week's lesson. The central issue, love or selfishness. And it's inter interesting those two words put together because last week, we would have given a bit of background into the whole war that started in heaven, its implications on earth, and now we're continuing into that because we are looking at the great controversy, this struggle, this, this warfare that appears to be happening behind the scenes, but which we are directly being impacted. And so we're looking at two of the issues that will come up in this great controversy and that is currently happening love and selfishness now generally people would assume or it is said that you know the opposite of love is hate we're we'll looking at selfishness because if you put those two words together it will almost give the impression that hey selfishness is really the opposite of love in many situations and so we have on one hand we have jesus and the godhead who would have demonstrated their love for us in many ways. While on the other hand, you have the enemy, Satan, as we, as we found out, you know, he was from Lucifer to the devil to Satan, that same being who seems to be so encapsulated in himself and is basically the embodiment of selfishness. And so as we go through this week's lesson, we'll see how that is born about. So let's look at our memory text on the next slide and in your quarterly. It is taken from Isaiah 41, verse 10. It says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And again, as I would have said last week, as it relates to the scripture, sometimes even without going into the actual lesson, the memory text alone can give you so much power. Because here in the book of Isaiah, God is reminding us, reminding you, that whatever you're going through, don't be dismayed. Because God is consistent and he will be with you and not only be with you, he will strengthen and help you and will uphold you. And at a time like this, sometimes when, when, when self takes, um, <laughs> the, the, the cares of this life so takes, takes us over, it's awesome to know that we have a God who will strengthen us and will be with us throughout each and every step. So for this week's lesson, we'll be looking at five key eras for the form from Thursday from Sunday to Thursday and let us go on the next slide so we'll be looking at the lessons from the destruction of Jerusalem and from that we'll be looking at the rejection of the love of God in your quarterly it will say a broken hearted savior we will also be looking at God's care for his people in your quarterly it will says it will say Christians providentially preserved 
also will be looking at the fidelity in the pursuit. In your quarterly, it will, says, it will say faithful amid persecution. We'll also be looking at our help for the needy. Your quarterly will say care for the community. And of course, we'll be looking at the legacy of love. So if you look on your slide right there, in the backdrop, if you can make out, if you can bring up the slides, if you can make out the, the, the pictures there, you will see what, hap, what appears to be a city under siege, a city engulfed in flames. And so this week, we would have started by providing a bit of historical context to the whole matter of the great controversy and how the whole issue of love and selfishness come about. And on your slide, it says the year 70 marked the end of Israel as a nation. Although it was Rome that devastated Jerusalem and the temple, other powers were involved in that war. On the one hand, Satan. And he and the, the third of the angels that he took incited Israel to reject the Messiah. So we know that, and, and in our studies, we, we know that when Jesus came, he was not accepted by everyone. He was outrightly rejected. So Satan incited Israel to reject the Messiah and then claim his right to destroy the nation. On the other hand, God warned repeatedly of the consequences of rejecting him, delayed the execution of the sentence, and prepared a people, the church, to pick up the torch of truth and illuminate the world with the message of God's love. And so there goes the context. So let us jump on to Sunday. Because at the top of your lesson, and we go over to the next page, next slide, which says, which speaks of the rejection of the, right, the rejection of the love of God. The scripture there says, as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives overlooking the city of Jerusalem, his heart was broken, John's gospel says. I'm reading from the quarterly here. Jesus came to his own and his own did not receive him. Jesus was outrightly rejected when he came here. The scripture on your slide, Matthew 23, verse 37, this is, this is Jesus, Jesus pretty much crying. It says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those, that se those sent to you, how oh, often have I longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under his wings, and you were not willing. From man sin, it has always been a struggle as it relates to coming back to God. Because it, our natural inclination since sin has been towards things of evil, things that are not good. And Jesus came here as perfect as he was with the love that he has. His prophets came before him, sent by God with messages of love, messages of hope, messages of, of rebuke and warning. And as Jesus said, they killed the prophets, they stoned them, and they're pretty much, they would have done the same to him. He wept over Jerusalem. He knew what was going to come. And, and for those of us who would have, would, would have read our lesson, we know about the destruction that, that eventually happened. But Jesus, in even pronouncing what was going to happen, he, his priority was to demonstrate his love and to win them back. No matter how Satan would have entangled them from creation up to that point, he came here to demonstrate love. And throughout his walk here, that's what he did. The slide says he cries because the tragedy could have been avoided, and that's as it relates to the, to the destruction. Because God loves us so much, he does not want anyone to die, but for everyone to have eternal life. And this seems to be taken from, even though it's not from, from John 3:16. this is just a, a snippet of it. From man sin, God's plan is a, to, have, to get everyone to have eternal life. He doesn't want us to die. History tells us 
that the Jews rebelled in the year 66 against Roman abuses. The various Jewish fractions fought against themselves while the Romans laid siege to the city. In the year 70, everything ended. Titus destroyed Jerusalem, and for those of us who would have read our quarter, would have um, read about Titus there. One million Jews perished. One million Jews. That's a mighty big number. And if you saw, if you read the slide above, it said all of this could have been avoided if, the, if persons did not reject God. But history, it continues, does not tell us how Satan incited the Jews to rebellion and the Romans to revenge. The destruction of Jerusalem was the direct works of the devil. By turning away from the source of life, Israel was at the mercy of an enemy that only seeks destruction and death. The scripture says the enemy only come to steal, steal, kill, and destroy. And it's the same thing happened to the Jews here. Satan's plan from inception, from he was kicked out of heaven, his plan is for the destruction of man. And he's always seeking opportunities to destroy you. He had this opportunity here immediately after Jesus would have concluded his ministry on earth. He had an opportunity to wipe out, pretty much wipe out so, much, so many Jews, and he did. Satan is not going to take it easy once he has you in his grasp. He will do whatever he can to destroy you, and that is what he did to the Jews back then. In our quarterly, it also shows, the, and again, we remember we're looking at love and selfishness. So we're speaking about Satan's selfishness here. Satan doesn't care about you, only cares about himself. And as we would have started, we saw Jesus weeping because he saw what was about to come and he saw the, the, how persons were unwilling to make the change toward him. Our quarterly says, God does not always intervene the to limit the results of his people's choices. He allows the natural consequences of rebellion to develop. God did not cause the slaughter of innocent children in the destruction of Jerusalem. The tragic death of the innocents was Satan's act, not God's. And you know, many times the question is asked, I don't know if to you as, as, a, as a Christian, but persons who question God's, ex God's existence will say, hey, if there is a loving God, why does he cause all of this to happen? As, the, script, as the, the lesson points out, God will not always intervene because things have to play out. There, if, if we sin, then we are supposed to be paying the consequences. And a lot of what is happening around us, the, the killings, the murders, the wars, is because of our sins is because we have rebelled against God. God sometimes intervenes and yes, we have those testimonies, but God will not always intervene because ultimately the penalty of sin must be shown. And please bear in mind that in God decided not to intervene or to intervene is no way a uh, a, a, a way to say, all right, he, he does not love us as how we sh think he should. God loves us with an everlasting love. And so the onus is on us to follow him so that we don't find ourselves in destruction. And as we will go, as we go throughout the quarter, we, real, we will realize that even in following him, we will encounter problems. We will encounter harsh situations. We will encounter um, serious issues but the difference with those who subscribe to the enemy and those of us who accept God is that they are pretty much doomed to eternal destruction while for us we have the hope of eternal life and what a choice to make as a matter of fact it seems such an easy choice enemy destruction, selfishness Jesus, eternal life. Seems such an easy choice to make. Yet, 
so many of us make the other decision. So the question I'm asking, ask you now as, a, as your partner, you may pose it in chat, why is it so easy to choose the bad? Why is it so easy to choose things that are not of God? And why does it seem so hard to do the good? Or maybe that is not your experience. Anybody? I have, I have an answer, but I would really want to hear. Why is it that it seems so hard to do good and seems so easy to do bad? And while I wait for some of those responses, let us now go to our next day's lesson on Monday, which says Christians providentially preserved. So we're going to our next slide. And here again, we're going to reinforce God's care for his people. The scripture says in Isaiah 41, verse 10, and it is also our memory text. So do not fear, I am with you. Do not be dismayed, I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In his love, and we're looking at this slide here, God gave an opportunity to everyone who wanted to escape destruction. I don't know if you're seeing, I don't know if you're seeing this, the, the PowerPoint clearly, um, but I'm just read, I'll just read it here. It says, in his love, God gave an opportunity to everyone who wanted to escape destruction. He gave us a sign, Jerusalem surrounded by the armies. So if we review our lesson, um, it shows us the, 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 the um, okay, let us jump to, 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 to the, the scripture here, Hebrews 11, 35 to 38. It says, women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better re resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yet moreover of bonds and imprisonment. And we won't read all of it, you can read it in your spare time. But in essence, it, it gives us a snapshot of what happened in that destruction. But as we would have studied in the previous lesson, Jesus gave us a warning. He gave us a sign. And he said, when you see the abomination of desolation, um, pretty much look up. And which also is a reminder to us in general that God will never send destruction upon us without giving us a warning, without giving us a sign. We living in the last days now have seen so many signs around us. The scripture speaks of wars and rumors of wars. We, we hear of, you know, speak of marriage and giving into marriage, similar to what happened in, to the, in the antediluvian world. We see what happened with, with the different um, groups now being formed different person with sexual, different sexual orientation. Persons not, when you see what happened, I don't, for what happened locally last week, when if you go online and you look, maybe look at, at the cleaner or the observer and you see, you know, the, the, the happenings on the streets, persons who were, were scantily clad and enjoying themselves. All of that right there are signs to us telling us that the end is near. When you see that sin is so rampant and it's just staring in your face, it's just a point for us to say, look up, something is coming. All of what we're seeing happening now is almost like what was happening um, in the city of Sodom and in the antediluvian world prior to the flood. History has a way of repeating itself. And God, as the slide reminds us, will give us a sign On the slide it says, everyone who believed in Jesus' words took advantage of that moment when Jerusalem was left unguarded to flee. A few moments later, Nero sent Vespian to quell the rebellion. From the year 60, 67 to 70, the siege was permanent. God can and wants to protect his children even in the most difficult times. However, Many have lost their lives because of their faithfulness to God. Why are some protected and others apparently 
and in this quote unquote abandoned by God. And I'm going to repeat the top part because, again, God gave the warning. So, who, those who listen to the warning, as a matter of fact, the, our scripture reminds us that all of the persons who listened to the warning and escaped Jerusalem, all the Christians escaped that siege, that destruction that happened there in Jerusalem. But those who did not listen, they were engulfed, they were killed, they were destroyed, and even as Hebrews, which I just read, it speaks of some of the harrowing things that happened. He said they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were slain with a sword. All of these things happened because of not listening to the warning of God. So going back to the question here, and maybe you can assist me. Why, are, why, it, why is it that some persons appear to be protected, while others maybe it appears to be abandoned by God? And maybe you can post that in the chat. It seems that, again, some person will say, hey, why is this thing happening to me while it's not happening to you or happening to somebody? Why did God spare some and not spare some? And there are many reasons for that. Um, first of all, we would have said from the outset that sin and rebellion, there, it has to be played out. God won't always intervene. And even if we look at the story of Stephen, who was not spared, even after, even half years after, we're still talking about Stephen. His, his faithfulness and how he held firm, we're still talking about today. It's such a powerful testimony. So sometimes these things happen as a warning, as a testimony for us to say, hey, um, I can encounter things, I will go through things, but God can keep me. And even if he doesn't keep me, I can still go down with Right? So we can't say definitively why some are inspired and why some are inspired, but ultimately we can trust God in his doing. Because some are inspired so that they can give their testimony of all them. Some, some were not spared, and years after, we still have their experiences to learn from. So we can be blessed by those experiences. I just heard that we have pretty much five minutes to wrap up. Did not realize that time was moving that fast. So let us jump to the slide that speaks of, and we're going to jump straight to, to Thursday's lesson for, for, because of time. And Thursday's lesson speak of caring for the community. And if we can bring up the slide. As Christians, we have an, we have an obligation to care for those who are in our care. Care for those who are in our very surrounding. Not only just our immediate family members, but the community. As Jesus demonstrated his love towards us, and we have been benefactors of that, we too have an opportunity and, a, and an obligation to extend this love to our fellow brothers and sisters. The church should not, the community should not just see us when we are doing programs or, or wanting to baptize them. But we have, again, an obligation to meet their needs. We have an obligation to connect with them. We have an obligation, ultimately, to show them love as how God has showed us love. And that was what was evident in the early church. As ambassadors of Christ, they imitated Jesus. By caring for the needs of those around them, they gained the favor of the entire town. As then, the church must be characterized by the love of Christians for each other and by concern for their community. So Sydney here is not just for Sydney Church. We are Sydney members. We have an, have an opportunity and an obligation to, to be concerned about all the communities that we serve because that is how they will truly see Jesus in us. And finally, to close off on Thursday with peace of love, the scripture there, John 13, verse 35, says, by, every, by this everyone will know that you are my disciple if you have love for one another. Love for one another. Or quarterly says, love was the norm of Christian communities in the first few centuries. They showed love. I, I, they were connected to God in such a way that they baptized so many persons 
even just a day's program, and you will see that thousands were won for the kingdom. And it's because they were genuine, they were loving, they were caring. I think about the world, you know. The world comes to expect a certain standard from us as Christians. And if they don't see it, they will point out our hypocrisy. And persons from the world won't run into church if they don't feel the love from the church. The very same person that we are, we are, we are preaching to, whether it be on our online platform or going into the communities, if they don't see that genuine love in us, they will not want to be a part of us. And even if they do come, they will exit through the doors as quickly as they come. And we see that happening. That's why oftentimes, you know, the church, they say the church of a high attrition rate, which is persons leaving. Because people don't come and feel the warmth and the love that the early church felt. So my prayer, my plea for us is that we try our very best to emulate God, emulate Jesus, to, act, to live our lives as our representatives of him and to show love, show love to each other in our church, in our family, and of course in our community. And by doing so, many, many souls will be one for him. I hope that you'd have taken something from this lesson. So many points to go over, but we weren't able to cover it because of the time. But I hope that something from the lesson will touch your heart as you go throughout this week. Let us pray. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the reviewing of your words. We pray, dear Lord, that you may continue to work on our hearts, work on us, dear Lord, so that we can be loving Christians to everyone and so that we can draw them to you. Continue to bless us and keep us as we go throughout today's service, I pray. Amen. Do have yourselves a, continue to have yourself a wonderful Sabbath as we now join at the Sabbath School team on in the main sanctuary. God bless you. Celebrations, rest. All humans need rest and relaxation. Without it, we can suffer cognitive impairments. But the chaotic world always has tempting demands and activities that might seem more important than quality rest. When you're tired, the executive functions of your mind suffer. You'll become Come less on. effective at recognizing the choices available to you and less capable of deciding which is best. Feeling tired not only makes you more stressed, but also inefficient, slower, less safe, and more likely to make mistakes. But how much sleep do you really need to make sure you stay at the top of your game? It varies between individuals, but experts agree that 7 hours of sleep per night is enough to get by. Establishing a regular bedtime ritual, eating lightly in the evening, and maintaining a quiet and peaceful environment for sleeping will help you get a good night's rest. Being well rested empowers you to be receptive to God's blessings and thus continually restored to optimal health. Mm -mm. Hello, 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 hello. How are you this morning? Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Ah, oh, dear, the lesson was so interesting. I'm so, I'm so sure this morning that you are happy to be here. You, you can imagine if you get two more hours, you'll just be going on and on because the lesson is so interesting. So I'm sure you are happy to be here that we can share with each other this morning. I am here to welcome you. Welcome, welcome to Sydenham Seventh-day Adventist Church this morning. Those from far, those from near, welcome. Those who are online, welcome. Visitors sitting next to us, Welcome, and even those who are in the hospital bed, anywhere you are watching onto Signum this morning, welcome. I welcome you. The Holy Spirit welcomes you. And somebody needs to welcome me now. God bless you. And let me tell you something. This is the day that the Lord has. And we must rejoice and do what? Oh, so your neighbor that is sitting beside you that you're seeing for the first time, please turn to your neighbor and say, welcome to Sydenham SDA Church. And if the, if the visitor will take a hug, give a hug. And if a handshake is good enough, just do that. Welcome one. Welcome all. Welcome to Sydenham. Enjoy the blessings that the Lord has in store for us on this, his holy day. God bless you.
So in closing Sabbath school this morning, remember we are looking on the dangerous seductions. False doctrines among the churches remove landmarks that the word of God has established. Few people stop when they have rejected just one truth. The majority set aside one after another of the principles of truth until they reject the Christian faith altogether. The errors of popular theology has driven many people to skepticism. It is impossible for them to accept doctrines that outrage their sense of justice, mercy, and kindness. Since the churches say that these are the teachings of the Bible, such people refuse to acknowledge it as the word of God. Many people look distrustfully at the word of God because it rebukes and condemns the sin. Those who are unwilling to obey try to overthrow its authority. Many reject religion in order to justify their neglect of duty. Others who loved ease too much to accomplish anything that requires self-denials acquire a reputation for superior wisdom by criticizing the Bible. Many feel it is a virtue to stand on the side of unbelief, skepticism, and irreligion. But underneath an appearance of honesty, they act from self-confidence and pride. Many delight in finding something in the scriptures to puzzle the minds of others. Some at first reason on the wrong side just because they love a controversy. But once they have openly expressed unbelief, they, join, they then join with the ungodly. And brethren, this is a, that sad state. And let me hope that as we ponder this, we realize that unbelief, skepticism, and all of that will not help us to make it to the kingdom. And in closing Sabbath school, we'll have the fosters doing their final song. But just ponder for a minute. Christ was on the cross. Two thieves were on either side. One said, Lord, remember me when thou comest in thy kingdom. Jesus paused death for a while, paused dying for a while to save that one sinner, that one thief on the cross. Brethren, here today, Jesus paused death to save you and I. Do not let that go in vain. Have a pleasant Sabbath. Happy Sabbath again, everyone. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Yes, man. Much better, much better. Some business affairs I heard a commotion A couple streets over And wondered what's happening there A young man was running From in that direction And stopped just to catch his breath I asked him to please tell me What was the hurry He smiled up at me and he said I was trying to catch the crippled man Did he run past his way? He was rushing home to tell everyone What Jesus did today And the mute man was telling myself And the deaf girl he's needing to answer God's call It's hard to believe but if you don't trust me, ask the blind man, he saw it all. Ask the blind man, he saw it all. My friends, if the troubles and burdens you carry are heavy and dragging you down, you tried everything you can possibly 
think of, but there's no relief to be found. That very same Jesus that altered the future of a blind man, the deaf and the lame. He's still reaching out in your hour of trouble. One touch and you're never the same. To be trying to catch the crippled man, did he run past his way? He was rushing home to tell everyone what Jesus did today. And the mute man was telling myself and the deaf girl he's leaving to answer God's call. It's hard to believe, but if you don't trust me, ask the blind man, he saw it all. Ask the blind man, he saw it all. Happy Summer Church. Can we get in an attitude of prayer? Let us pray. Dear God and our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much, Lord, for bringing us here one more Sabbath to worship you. We have taken us through a week of toil and labor. For many of us, Lord, it was a challenging week. But thanks be to God, it has been an overcoming week. And so, Lord, we praise you as we come into your courts today. What a privilege it is that, Lord, we can still come into your courts unmolested. We still have the freedom of worship. And for this, Lord, we give you thanks. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we come here today, may we empty ourselves, Lord. May we turn our cups up so that we can be filled, be filled with your Holy Spirit. In a very special way, Lord, we present our young people before you who, will be, who have been leading out from morning until now. And we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to pour your Holy Spirit upon them so that, Lord, as they minister to your people, they too will be ministered unto. Father, we pray for those who might be having various challenges, whether it is health challenge, financial challenge, whatever the challenge is, emotional challenges. We know, Lord, that we live in a time when, oh God, so many things are coming at us. And Lord, we, it's as if we do not even have time to, to process what is happening, but we recognize, Lord, that the devil is after our minds. And so, Lord, we pray that you help us to be still and to know that you are God. In a very special way, we want to present to those of us in our congregation who are entrepreneurs. We pray, God, that you will give them wisdom, give them understanding that as they plan for their businesses, Lord, that it will be of such that they will get customers from the east, the west, the north, and the south. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will help us as a people, that we seek out your people who have businesses so that, God, we can support these businesses. And, Father, we pray that you will help these business owners, that they will not take their customers for granted, but that, God, they will offer the best service so that we'll have no choice but to go to them. Father in heaven, we pray that you will remember those who have been locked in for various reasons and who cannot be here this morning, and who, but who have, Lord, the privilege of worshiping online. We pray that you continue to bless these individuals also and in a special way lord i just want to place before you those who i can recall even now sister shaw i know that she is there 
listening to us and worshiping with us, Sister Roper, Sister Woodhouse, Sister Levy, Brother Reed, Sister Williams, Lord, those I can recall at this point, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bring a special, special blessing upon them today. And for those who listen from all over the world, may something be said here today that we seek to draw them closer to you. Recognize, Lord, that we are living in the end of time. And Father, we pray that you'll help us that we'll not play around with our salvation. But that, oh God, we'll recognize that indeed time is running out. And that, Lord, we will totally surrender to you because we know not the day. We know not the hour. But, Lord, you have admonished us that we should watch and pray lest we come into temptation. So, God of heaven, I pray that you'll help us, Lord, that we'll flee the very presence of evil. And that you'll help us, Lord, that we'll totally, totally immerse ourselves in you. Father, give us wisdom. You are directing us. Help us, Lord, to listen to you so that as you direct us, Lord, we can make that move that you want us to make. Be with all the evangelistic series. Oh, God of heaven, be with the program at Hilleron and help us as a church, Lord, that we'll gather together to give support whenever we are called upon to do so. Father, send down your Holy Spirit upon us today. The distractions that are normally here, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we pray that you'll send your angels, Lord, to bind up the stronghold of evil so that, God, we can focus on you today and that, Lord, we can be blessed by you. Have your own sweet way in our lives now. Today we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and a happy Sabbath church. Happy Sabbath to all the members and the visitors. Happy Sabbath to everyone this morning. Um, I, I, did, I, did, I did a little research in my class this morning. And uh, I was a bit surprised of the outcome. So it just dawned on me that I need to do a larger research and to see what's the outcome. Let me see the hands of all the members of Sydenham Seventh-day Adventist Church. All the members. Let me see your hands. Raise your hand, man. If once you're a member of the church, no, don't feel afraid. Don't. I'm looking and I'm, not, I'm seeing some members and I'm not seeing. Don't be afraid. Me not trick no. Sister Carl, put up your hand. You're a member. Brother Williams, yes, all the members, all the members, I need to see your hands. All right, someone is still not put up on hand. Put, put on hand, put on hand. All right. I want to see all the members that are present that are not on the church's WhatsApp group. Let me see your hands. One. All right, my class, you can't take down on your hand. Me get to the name already. <laughs> Let me see the hands of all those who are not on the church's notice group, the WhatsApp group. All right, all right. All those who are not, let me see a stand. Brother Jermaine, brother, um, where are the church clerks? I, I, I want for you to get their names. Get their names. Get their names. All the members who you are not a part of the church's notice board. Let them come to you. All right. Sister Manners, please stand. Please stand, Sister Manners. She have a whole heap of manners, you know. Sister Manners, please stand. Look at Sister Manners. Look at Sister Manners. I'm going to ask you to give your name and your number to Sister Manners. Don't let today pass. Don't let today pass and don't give your name and your number to her. It is very, very, very important. I said to my class this morning, 
did you see a notice that was sent out? And I said, where? What? <laughs> and it was then I recognized that so many of our members are not being informed on a weekly basis. This is the, the, the place where the church will send out notices. Any emergency, that's where we send it out. Any urgent message, that's where we send it out. We won't be able to drive or call everybody, but we send it out there. And so many of you would not have seen then that I send out a thank you message if you are not there. And this morning, I want to, 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 to say thank you to all the members who would have supported the initiative in Ilron. Brethren, we start January, we go February, we go March, and we are now in when? April. We, uh, we went into fourth gear. And can I tell you, for those of you who were there, the fourth gear was really a fourth gear. Am I right? We did enjoy the blessings of the Lord down in Ilron. It seems like we have to always go far places. When we go far places, we get a lot of support. Bridget, I want to thank you for your support. I was surprised. Yes, I want to eat to the call. And I am so happy this morning. I am so happy. You know, this week I test my blood pressure. I test my blood pressure this week, you know, for a long time. I haven't. And I test my blood pressure. And it was very, 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 very good. <laughs> I test my blood pressure this week. And I, I, I encourage all of you to do so. Keep a check on your health. All right. While well, sister, sister... Sister Brown Carr is coming to do a health promotion. I want to also thank those who have joined us online for the meeting. Over, and I know that some of you didn't get the opportunity to come in person, but you joined online because I saw the numbers. It was over 200. Over 200. Give yourself a hi fi. Yes, yes, yes. It was over 200 on the platform, plus who was present. I want to thank you. Continue to support, and I'm going to ask that all of us will take the initiative to reach out to someone, to help them to, to come to the Lord. And remember, we are doing all these field works, all these field work in preparation to a large campaign that will be in the city of Spanish Town. All these campaigns are gearing up to a large campaign that will be in the city of Spanish Town come this August. All of Spanish Town will be involved, including the Sydenham Seventh day Adventist Church and all the communities that we serve. So, if we have to get bus to transport all the communities individually, we'll have to do that. We want the message of God to reach every single solitary person in our communities. So I'm depending on you. Get the names. Bring them come. Let us work together. All of us are evangelists. All of us are Bible workers. God has given all of us the breadth. And if we can just say, come to church with me, and you can't find the right passage, ask the Lord to help you and find somebody else to help you, to help somebody to be in the kingdom of God. Loving Father, we thank you for this great gospel. We thank you for the messages that you have given unto us. We pray, Lord, as we go out and to preach and teach and to encourage and to most importantly, as we study this week, that we live our lives for you. For, Lord, the apostles preach they teach, they encourage, but the lives that they live was what brought so many people to you. Lord, for us, forgive us. Bring us back to the place where you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, brethren, in terms of health, 
um, we, have we have formed two health groups. So group one has Sister Nakita Wallace, Sister Tashai Allwood Carr, Sister Janice Reed, and Brother Lance. And group two has myself, Sister Nicole Brown, Sister Andrea Golding, and Sister Daniel Grant. All right, the, groups that, the group that is on duty this week is group one, which is Sister Nakita, Sister Tashai. They are the only two here today. So any issues you have, you can attend to them. Group two will be on next week, and we alternate it. So each week, our team will be on. I'm reminding our brethren that we do our blood pressure, blood sugar checks every last Saturday night of the month. The Minister of Health is on a campaign to know your numbers. And at Sydenham, I'm also encouraging you to know your numbers. Know your blood pressure number. Know what your blood sugar level is. Know what your sugar is continually, what your pressure is continually. And brethren, if you do your checks and your pressure is high or your sugar is high, do not sit with it and think it is a gift. It is not a gift. It, people are dying right, left, and center. If your blood pressure is high continually, it damages your heart, it damages your kidney, it damages your eyesight. The end result is aneurysm, heart attack, stroke. Know your numbers, get your medication, sort yourself out, and when we have it, come and have your checks done and get your advice accordingly. Thank you very much. Happy Sabbath, everyone. On behalf of the First Elder and the Board of Elders, welcome to Sydney Seventh-day Adventist Church. These are the announcements for today. The funeral service for Brother Osman Graham, that is the husband of Sister Marva Graham, she's seated at the back, will be held at the Spanish Town Seventh-day Adventist Church tomorrow at 10 a.m. That is at the Spanish Town Seventh-day Adventist Church at 10 a.m. On another somber note, Brother Handel Taylor, who was a master guide and a drill major for the Central Jamaica Conference, passed away yesterday morning. We are asking you to keep his family, his wife, Julie, and his children in your prayers. Bible class is at 3.30 p.m. Today will be communion with the persons that are shut-ins. The elders will be going out this evening. Brother and sister Calbert Johnson will be traveling. Please keep them in your prayers. Sister June Williams is asking all teachers to meet with her right after Divine Hour for a short meeting. Deacon's meeting also will be this tonight after Vespers. All right, from the women's ministry. Tomorrow, Sunday, April 14th at 2 p.m., Tomorrow, Sunday, April 14th at 2 p.m. will be the Women's Ministries Grand Social. So women, please come out and enjoy yourselves. <laughs> Sorry, Women's Ministries. So women, come out and enjoy yourselves and gentlemen. You are also invited to come and fellowship with us. And Sister Cochrane would like to meet with all the women after, right after Divine Hour, just for a short meeting. Special needs? Okay, Sister Carr is reminding the church of the care packages. There is the barrel over there to my right. When you have your care, put your care packages together and you can deposit it in the barrel over there for special needs. The barrel will be there up until, or it's always there. So get your stuff together. We want toiletries, any little thing that you can put together and put it in the barrel. Thank you. Children's choir practice this evening at 5 p.m. All right. Have a wonderful Sabbath.
Celebrations, Choices Life is full of choices. Every day you make countless decisions, all adding up to determine the overall fabric of your life and, to a large extent, your health. Everyone has to deal with the consequences of their choices, but with the abundance of options to choose from, it's easy to forget about the impact they have. The good news is, there's a solution. The key to decision making is intentionality. Intentionality means making evidence-based decisions. It gives direction and order to your life. Considering your choices with intentionality brings you one step closer to doing the right thing for your health. Regardless of the choices you've already made, today is an opportunity to choose better, to start fresh. You may not be able to change the consequences of your past decisions, but that's okay. You can choose to get over your mistakes and live better from now on. Invite God to be part of your decisions. Ask Him to help you make the right choice. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Sabbath. How are you doing today? Are you blessed? Amen. Isn't it an awesome feeling to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Now, as we sit in the presence of the Lord, I want us to lift the name of the Lord on high. So we're going to tune our voices and sing together. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show. Happy Sabbath, church. The Lord's name is worthy to be praised. Wouldn't you say so? Amen. There is power in the name of Jesus. Wouldn't you say that as well, church? Amen. All right. Church, have you, ever felt, have you ever felt very happy or very overwhelmed or very sad, but you couldn't find the word, and you want to pray, you want to speak to Jesus, but you couldn't find the words to describe how you're feeling? Have you ever felt that way? Yes. All right. So... Luckily, we have music, and music has a way of allowing us to say things and express things that we normally would struggle to say with regular words or speaking. And so, we are about to sing and let God know that 
we are grateful for him and that we acknowledge that there is power in his name and just by simply singing to him we can express our praise to him so let us do that now my heart sings praises my heart sings praises each time i say your name this love is deeper than simple words can say you go before me you go before me to make the perfect way to make a perfect way my one desire is to give you perfect my one praise. desire is to give you and all the good things that he has done. But in one of my favorite passages of scripture, in Lamentations, Jeremiah, he talks about all of his afflictions, all of the horrible things that he's been going through. But then, he remembered something very important, and I want all of us to remember, because it's very important. And he said, This I recall to mind, therefore I have hope. It is of the Lord's mercies, that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness.
I invite the congregation to stand. The praise team just sung, Great is your mercies towards me, and we are eternally grateful for the mercies of God that he continued to extend unto us, unworthy though we may be. It is a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord this morning as we th stand for the call to worship as we continue our divine, our service today. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, called upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing unto him, sing psalms unto him. Talk ye all his wondrous works. Glory, glory ye in his holy name. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. The church is called to worship. Father, as we come in your presence today, we pray that you will abide with us. And as we send up the praises to you, the blessings will come down upon your people. 
Bless this worship service, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll turn our hymnals to 633. That's 633. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercies and his grace in the mansion, bright and blessed. He'll prepare for us a place. atmosphere. Just want to say welcome, welcome, welcome to our visitors wherever you are. Can you give me a wave please? Visitors, amen. Amen church. We, today we are blessed with visitors. Truly we are happy that you made Sydenham your choice today. Members, you're here as usual and for that I want to say welcome. Thank you all for coming. To those who are online or sharing with us virtually, in like manner also, I just want to say welcome. Welcome, welcome one and all. Have a blessed Sabbath. At this time, we will have Evangelion to give us the anthem of praise.
Humans need rest and relaxation. Without it, we can suffer cognitive impairments. But the chaotic world always has tempting demands and activities that might seem more important than quality rest. When you're tired, the executive functions of your mind suffer. You'll become less effective at recognizing the choices available to you and less capable of deciding which is best. Feeling tired not only makes you more stressed, but also inefficient, slower, less safe, and more likely to make mistakes. But how much sleep do you really need to make sure you stay at the top of your game? It varies between individuals, but experts agree that 7 hours of sleep per night is enough to get by. Establishing a regular bedtime ritual, eating lightly in the evening, and maintaining a quiet and peaceful environment for sleeping will help you get a good night's rest. Being well rested empowers you to be receptive to God's blessings and thus continually restored to optimal health.
Amen. Amen. Indeed, the Lord is worthy of our praise. And as we continue with our worship, we are going to show our gratitude with our thanksgiving of offering and tithes. I invite the deacons to take up their respective positions. Let us pray. Great God and youth of this universe, we just want to express our thankfulness to you. And so, Lord, as we come with our offerings, tithes as well, pray, Father, that it will be acceptable into your sight, is our humble asking in Jesus' name. Uh, Luke 16 and verse 10 says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? This is the word of the Lord, not me. Deacons, you may proceed. field now ripened there's a work for all to do so how the man calling to the harvest calling you and does the place you're called to labor seem so small or little known it is great when God is in it and he won't forsake his own little is much when God is in it labor not for wealth or fame there's a crown Give thee about thine own. Try. 
Sabbath Church, please remain standing for the scripture reading which comes to us from 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 17, and I'll read in your hearing. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Here's a portion of God's holy word. Let us thank him by saying, Amen. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, church. I invite us all in our closet prayer to remember the family of our late brother who passed suddenly. Also, uh, two brothers who passed almost the same time. You must have heard it because it's not a secret. The mother was getting ready to go abroad to bury one. And by the time the other one is to get ready to take her to the airport. He passed. It's a friend of the family, cousin is friend of the family, so I ask that you remember them. It's not easy, but until it reaches your door, we'll understand. So let us remember them as we pray. Shall I ask us to reverently bow our heads? Now, dear Lord, Mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary, creating me a clean heart, Jehovah God, and renew a right spirit within me. This morning, Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be alive. We thank you for your watch care over us during the six days of toil and labor. Truly in you we live and move and have our being. We are so grateful, Lord, for the fresh air we can breathe. We can walk about, we can talk. Oh God, how excellent is your name in all the earth. This morning we come to praise you because you deserve our praise. So help us to forget our cares and magnify you. Paul asks, what shall separate us from the love of God? This morning, Lord, despite our besetment, please hold us to your wounded side and strengthen us when we get weak. We magnify you for provisions you have made during the week, for taking care of our children on the road to school, for watching over us. Oh, Lord, we truly wrestle not against flesh and blood. So this morning, we thank you for being the victor one more time for us. As we come today, nothing in our hands we bring but we beg you to clothe us with your righteousness. We praise your name for the Holy Spirit. Oh Lord, we take it for granted sometimes the fact that we are in our right minds and we can move about. Help us to magnify you and to praise you in spite of. This morning we ask that you remember all your children gathered worldwide, worshiping in obedience to your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit will grace the worship, that it will not be in vain. Oh Lord, the song says, if I can help somebody as I pass along, then my living will not be in vain. 
We know that when we shall pass this way, so any good thing we can do, help us to recognize, help us to discern, because tomorrow is not promised to us. We pray this morning, Lord, for your spoken word. We pray that you will lodge them in our hearts so it will not be just another listening, another setting, but we'll take heed to our ways. Remember those who are sad. Remember those who mourn. Remember those who are ill, Lord, our shut-ins, and those who are at some point unhappy, discouraged, depressed. We pray that you'll be a comfort to them because many a times only you know the struggles they are going through. Be with our young people in a very special way today. Our children, so much peer pressure, so much social media bombardment. Oh God, they are up against a force. But we pray in the name of Jesus that you'll break every chain and set your children free. Because your wish that all be saved. So we lift them up in a special way today those within the sanctuary, those at home. Provide for them, Father, in these hard times. And remember our children at school. There's so much going on in the classroom. From the age of seven, nine, go up, God, it is not easy. We pray especially today for our educators, our teachers. They are doctors, they are nurses, they are mother, they are father. Oh, Jesus, please have mercy and take full control of the minds of these children. We place the one who will break the bread at this moment before you. Lord, touch his tongue with a live coal. And may you water our thirsty soul and help us that we'll be closer drawn to you. Remember those are on the road traveling to and from churches. All the evangelistic crusades going on, oh God. The word is going far and wide, leaps and bound. Oh God, help us to take heed because it's seconds to midnight. Have mercy upon us and help us to live the life that counts, to be living Bible, to be read of men. Have mercy upon us and save us, O oh God. Save us because you shall come very soon. In Jesus' name we beg. Amen. You would agree with me that we serve an awesome God. We serve a God of love and also a God of mercy. Am I right? We serve a God who believes in justice, but he also believes in judgment. But before this loving God destroy anything or anyone he always always send a warning he always send a warning and right across the the bible we see where god would have sent a warning before any destruction that's love that's love today i don't know if it's a warning that we are going to get but God has, uh, God has a man to provide a word. Whatever the word is, let us accept it graciously. I speak of one of our serving elders at the Sydenham Seventh-day Adventist Church. He has served the church in many capacities. He have a wonderful family. His wife is sitting in the congregation. His children, not sure if they are here. But he has served the church, the Sydenham Seventh-day Adventist Church, faithfully. He is one who loved the work of God and loved the word of God. He serves 
as the men ministry's leader of this church and also in the personal ministry's department and many other departments. I speak today of God's manservant, Elder Sheldon Williams. Did I say Williams? <laughs> Elder Sheldon Elliot. <laughs> Elder Sheldon Elliot. I know he loves poems, so I don't know if he's going to be poetic today, but he is a lover of poems. Before he comes, I hope I get this one right. Before he comes, the group Evangelone, Evangelion, they will come and bless our hearts with a song of meditation. The next voice will be of Elder Sheldon Elliott. Oh, 
Good morning, saints of God. All right. Good morning, saints of God. Indeed, it is a wonderful morning God has given us. He has been good to us. He has kept us through the past week. And today we are here in his sanctuary, Elder Bennett. He says in what? Exodus 25, verse 8, let them build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among my people. And God is with us, amen? Emmanuel, God is with us. And we are glad that we serve a God who is able and a God who is capable. And so let me thank um, the youth choir. Indeed, that's very much a appropriate meditation song, amen? Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Truly, God has been good to us. Let me also thank Elder O'Neill Mattis for his kind words of introduction. And I would be very elated if my good friend and brother, um, Sheldon Williams, is now an elder. Amen. <laughs> All right. And so God has afforded us this privilege to be in his courts, to be in his sanctuary, to worship him in the beauty of holiness. Let us pray. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Father, I am here unworthy. But Lord, I come here this morning not by might, nor by strength, but through the power of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, I pray, as was sung by the youth choir, the new branded youth choir, let the words of my mouth 
and the meditation of my heart. Let them be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. The Exodus is one of the most unforgettable stories that have been told in the Bible. Amen. Books have been written about the Exodus. Movies have been made. Epic movies have been made. The Ten Commandments. And our own <clears throat> musical icon, Robert Nestor Marley, made a song and an album of the same name. Exodus, Movement of Ja People. This thrilling encounter of God the Creator who said, who spoke and it was done, the one who commanded and it stood fast, through his manservant Moses and one of the most powerful monarchs of the then known world, Ramesses II or Pharaoh, as an epic encounter of the great controversy. We are truly part of this great controversy between God and Satan. And through the centuries, different individuals have done their part to preserve the word and truth of God. Amen? And of course, Moses, who was called out by God, a matter of fact, Moses means to be pulled from the river. And we know the story quite well of Moses. We all know as well the story of Joseph. Or God allowed him to go to Egypt and to ensure that his children survived. Amen? However, there are many lessons to be learned from this awesome and tantalizing experience. We saw the awesome, powerful God Almighty had complete dominance over nature and all other gods. Amen? There is no God like Jehovah. Amen? Firstly, I will be reflecting on the Israelites' journey through the wilderness of sin. From Egypt to Canaan, the promised land. And secondly, as much as it is said, comparisons are odious. I will draw comparisons between the Israelites' experience throughout the wilderness and our own journey as Seventh-day Adventists to the promised land, New Jerusalem. Amen. And so we are called as Seventh-day Adventists to be separate to be peculiar people. And we are on our trek, on our journey to the promised land. One man write the book, Pilgrim Progress. Today I could say Seventh-day Adventist process. Um, progressed. From 1844, after the great disappointment, God's people were given special instructions. And so, out of the disappointment, the Seventh-day Adventist Church was formed, a remnant of those who were disappointed, the disappointed Elder Bennett. A remnant remained, and they searched the Scripture diligently, and they recognized the truth that it was the investigative judgment that began in 1844. And so today, I will be comparing our spiritual journey to that of the Israelites. They should have spent 40 days wandering in the wilderness. But because of disobedience, because of stick stiff nakedness they spend over almost 40 years in the wilderness 
May he, may, may, sorry, may, could it be that it is because of disobedience? Could it be that it is because of stiff nakedness? Could it be that we are now 120 years into the investigative judgment? Could it be? Could it be that it's because of our inconsistencies as a remnant church? We are here wandering in the wilderness of war. And so, as I open the word of God, I want to know that God's people who are called by his name are listening to the word that he will be presenting to us today. The Israelites living in Egypt was not an event of chance. For those who teach mathematics, we know that probability is favorable event over all possible events. That's positive. Or unfavorable event over all events. And so it was not perchance Elder Bennett. It was not perchance Elder Williams. You see, divine providence had it so. And long before the Exodus, Genesis 15 verse 13, God says, and he said unto Abraham, Know for surety that thy seed shall be in a strange land that is not theirs. Know for certainty that thy seed shall be in a strange land that is not theirs. And shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for hundred years. So it wasn't an event by chance. It was divine providence. However, Egypt was supposed to be a temporary residence. Did you know that? Egypt was supposed to be a temporary residence for God's people. However, we have seen over 400 years, more than 10 generations, if we calculate the generation by every 30 years. And so, <clears throat> the Israelites should have been green card holders, not citizens in Egypt. However, they were more than green card holders, over 400 years, over 10 generations. Exodus 6 verse 7 says, Wherefore said the children, so wherefore said the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burden of the Egyptians and I will rid you of their bondage and I will deem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgment. So God here promised Israel through his servant Moses that he will redeem them with a stretched forth arm. Amen? You see, the green card holder does not have the same privileges as the citizen. You know that. Hmm? The Israelites should have been different. They should have been distinct. They should be set apart from the Egyptian citizens. In like manner, as Seventh-day Adventists, we must be what? Distinct. We must be what? Set apart. Hallelujah. We must be what? Different from the world. And so the Israelites should not worship the Egyptian gods. But no doubt many did. The Israelites should not worship the Egyptian god. But no doubt many did. In like manner, many of us as Seventh-day Adventists, we are worshiping gods other than the true God. Amen? And so we are called that we need to turn this around. The Israelites should be different. They should be distinct. They should be set apart. The Israelites should worship no other God 
but the God Jehovah. In like manner, we are spiritual Israel. And we are indeed in Egypt. We are also in Babylon. They both represent the creeds and doctrines practiced by the Antichrist. I'll say that again. We are in spiritual Egypt as well as Babylon. And they both represent the creeds, the doctrines, and practices of the Antichrist. And so Revelation 18 verse 4 says we what? Come out of her, my people, and partake not of her sins. That is the call today that we should come out of spiritual Egypt. We should come out of Babylon and partake not with her sins. First Peter 2 verse 9 says, Adventists, you are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. And you should show forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into a marvelous light. I'll be showing forth his praises. Yes, God has to liberate the Israelites from Egyptian bondage and Egyptian slavery. Exodus 6 verse 7 says, And I'll take you for my people, and I'll be to you a God. And he shall know that I am your God, which bringeth you out of bondage. Today, God is saying to us, as he said to Israel um, then, he has taken us out of bondage, hallelujah. And while we may not have been in physical slavery, we have been slaves to sin. And God is calling us to be peculiar. He's calling us to be a special people. He says, you will be my people and I will be your God. And he shall know that I am your God, which bringeth you out of spiritual bondage. Similarly, God wants to liberate us from the bondage and slavery of Babylon. That is the bondage of sin. Amen. <clears throat> Revelation 18 verses 4 says, And I hear another voice from ever saying, With a loud voice, Come out of her, my people, that ye may not be partakers of her sins, and receive not her plagues. The plagues are coming as they were in Egypt, so they will be in the latter days. Romans 6 verse 18 says, Be then made free from sin. Galatians 5 verse 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty where which Christ has made us free, and be ye not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. God has liberated us. Let us live a life that is fully liberated in Christ. Verse 13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty as an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. The Bible tells us that we, they will know that we are Christians by our love. They will know that we have love one for another. That is how men will know that we love love God and love our fellow men if we have love one for another. So Israel was liberated from the Egyptian bondage by the mighty hand of God. Exodus 32 verse 11 And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Why art thou not walked wrought against thy people which thou had brought forth out of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. Why God has liberated us, each one of us, as a testimony, each one of us as a story to tell of how God has liberated us. And so God has brought us out of spiritual Egypt with great power and a mighty hand. 
And so we have been released from the chakra of sin by the grace of God. Amen. And the mighty work of the Holy Spirit. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die by the life that we live. The Bible says, The soul that sinneth shall surely die. And so we deserve death. But thank be to God, the scripture did not end there. It says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And today we can celebrate life because we have Jesus. John 14 verse 3 says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Amen. Jesus Christ is our liberator. And if we have been set free from the bondage of sin, we are free indeed. Ephesians 2 verse 8 says, by grace are we saved, hallelujah. By grace are we saved. You see, grace is unmerited favor. We deserve to die. We have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But God, in the fullness of time, sent forth his son, amen, to die on the cross to redeem us. From our sin. And no wonder we can sing with the songwriter. Redeemed. Oh I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb. Redeemed to his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. For John 16 verse 13 says. For in the spirit of truth is come. Hallelujah. He will guide to all truth. And that is what happened. With the pioneers of the Adventists. The Holy Spirit guided them to the truth of the Sabbath. The Holy Spirit guided them. Having liberated his people from Israel, from Egypt, from the shackles of the Egyptian bondage and slavery, Israel was required to be what? Transformed. Amen? When God liberates us, we are expected to be transformed. The Bible says, be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of the mind. And so God, when he called Israel, he called them to be transformed. During their 4,000 years of living in Egypt, they have inculcated, they have acquired, and they have adopted several practices, lifestyles, and ways of the Egyptians which were contrary to the will of God. And no wonder these habits, these practices needed to be called. And so the first thing that God did to the Israelites is that he baptized them. Hallelujah. They were required to be baptized, fully submerged. Hence they're passing through the Red Sea. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 1 and 2 says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all, were all under the cloud as they passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. Hallelujah. So God, that going through the Red Sea was a baptism. And it was fully submersion. Hmm? They were fully immersed. They were not sprinkled. And so, as contemporary Christians, we are required to be baptized. Amen. Jesus himself had no sin, yet he baptized. A matter of fact, when he went to John, John said to him, Listen, man, I am unworthy. Jesus says, let it be so, let it be fulfilled. Because he was setting an example for us. John 1 verse 13 says, which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Hallelujah. Mark 16 verse 16 says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. 
I'll read it again. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And that is why the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. And I like this part. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Hallelujah. Salvation is for everyone. All we need to do is believe. And so the Israelite lived in, in Egypt needed to be reformed. They needed to get rid of the bad practices adopted in Egypt. God allowed them to experience the wilderness of reformation, the topic of my discourse, the wilderness of reformation. Firstly, they were called to remember the Sabbath day, amen? They were entrenched in the Egyptians' ways of life. The Sabbath commandment was cast aside and the sanctity of the day was forgotten. However, before they reached the promised land, the reform has to be practiced, amen? Well, I did say, before they reach the promised land, they need reformation. In like manner, Sidenham, in like manner, SDAs, we need to be reformed before we enter the promised land. And one of the reforms that we need is the Sabbath reform. Today, the only command God specified to remember, Christendom has forgotten. I'll say that again. The only commandment that God has specifically said, remember, Christendom has forgotten. And sometimes some of us Seventh-day Adventists are forgetting. Exodus 20 verse 8 says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Amen. Remember, remember, remember. God used remember. But he says what? Remember Lot's wife. Remember SDAs, the seventh commandment. That is what defines us. That is what makes us who we are. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But let me give you some benefits of the Sabbath rest. Amen? And several studies have been conducted. And their results are awesome. Let me share those studies with you. In 2019, Speedlin did a study. And he recognized that the Sabbath rest, all right, you have spirituality development. What it does? It provides spirituality development. We can't be wrong, eh? The creator must be right, and we must be wrong. Number two, Superville and others. They say et al. Sir Arrow. Latin mean and others. 2014, number two. Improve mental and physical health functioning. That is what the Sabbath rest provides. Hallelujah. Improve mental and physical health functioning. Superville and others in 2014. And in 2013, Deans and Kane, they, they, they did a study and they recognized that the Sabbath rest Strengthening relationship with others. So it helps us to what? Fellowship one with another. And the Bible tells us what? Iron sharpens iron. And we should not forsake the assembly of the brethren. So my online friends, I know you are assembling. Even though you are virtual, you are with us in mind and body. Well, mind and spirit. And so the Sabbath... Gives spiritual benefits, it gives physical benefits, and it gives collective benefits. Amen. And so, 
We as Seventh-day Adventists need to ensure that we keep the Sabbath and keep it holy. With all these benefits and with all the specification of God, Christians often forget the Sabbath. Eh? It is says, and yet Christians have not only forgotten, but Christendom under the lamb-like beast will legislate a counterfeit Sabbath. And this, they, the Bible says in Daniel 27 verse 25, and he speak great, sorry, and he shall speak great words against what? The most high. And shall wear out the saints of the most high. And think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and dividing of times. So now all long Satan prevails. The Bible says our adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil is like what? A roaring lion. But the key point is that he has but what a short time. And so the Bible says, they shall be given into his hands until time and times and dividing of times. And so this shows his limit and he's working over time to destroy God's people. We have one free, this they seek to justify. All right? And the justification, my brothers and sisters, they're going to use to implement a day of rest is the climate change phenomenon. Amen? Yes, they will use the covering of climate change. They will say, we need to have a day free of pollution. They will say the earth needs to rest to slow down the factors which are accelerating climate change. That will be the argument. That will be the justification of those who are putting forward that the Sabbath or Sunday should become a Sabbath. Nonetheless, while we recognize that they are changed, these changes are occurring in the environment, these are a result of greed. What did I say? These are a result of greed, selfishness, lack of proper, lack of proper management of the earth resources by mankind. So the climate changes that are occurring that we are seeing today is as a result of mankind's greed, is a result of mankind inappropriate actions against the environment. We have not managed the resources that God has given us. We have not been good stewards. And this is because of greed. Because there are some who want to be rich while others remain poor. This earth has enough resources to be properly shared among everyone. And I'm not preaching socialism. But it's a reality of life. I'll also mention that man has gone into what I call spiritual degeneracy. degeneracy. Our spirituality has been going down and down. It has been a downhill slide for man. As it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be in our days. The Bible says that the heart of men were evil continually. But thank be to God, the Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Can God say the first seven day Adventist, but God found favors with the SDAs? Can God say that? When within the Seventh-day Adventist church, there are those who are advocating same-sex marriage. Can God say the same about us for those who are promoting 
lesbianism. God was able to say of Noah, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I pray and hope that God can say of me and you that we found grace and favor in his eyes. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5 tells us the state of man. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. I say, my brothers and sisters, without any controversy, perilous times are here. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to their parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despise of, of those who are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than the lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. You know, this week I was listening to a video presentation by a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. He was a gay pastor. He was a gay before. And he was transformed, hallelujah, by the Holy Spirit. And what is being proposed now is that persons who are born this way. No. The Bible says what? Be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind. It is their mind which is in the gutter. And their minds need to be transformed. Let this mind be in you that is also in Christ Jesus. If they do not divest themselves of the mind that is corrupt, the mind that is polluted, then they will not be transformed. As it was in Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be in the hand. As it was in the day of Noah, so shall it be in the hand. And so, the solution is given to us in Second Chronicles 7. Second Chronicles 7 verse 24. That is the solution that God has given us where climate change is concerned. It is not about having a day free of pollution. Well, we can use pollution symbolically, but the pollution of sin. Second Chronicles 7 verse 24 says, was it? no, sorry, verse 14. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and listen, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins, hallelujah, and I will heal their land. Did you see that? God says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. So all that we are speaking about climate change, if we as God's people pray, God will turn it around. Hallelujah. God will turn it around. The second link, Israel had to undergo a diet reform as they journey through the wilderness of sin. They have acquired a taste for the Egyptian delicacies and unclean flesh, which became a daily practice. Flesh meat was the order of the day, and I say no pun intended. Flesh meat was what? The order of the day. God wanted to remove their crave for meat out of Israel's life as they journeyed to the promised land. God gave them a special diet of manna 
Manna is angels' food. Psalm 78, verse 25. And I read it in your hearing. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children. No, sorry, 25. 25. Not 20, not 5. Man did eat angels' food. He sent them meat to the full. Hallelujah. And so God has to reform the diet of Israel as they move out of spiritual, as they move out of the bondage of Egypt. Even so, God wants to re reform our diet as we move out of spiritual Egypt. I say it again, Seventh-day Adventists, God wants us to reform <clears throat> our diet as we move out of spiritual Egypt. And I'm going to quote some things from Ellen G. White. She says, cancers, tumors, and all inflammatory diseases are largely caused by meat eating. I read it again. Cancers, tumors, and all inflammatory diseases are largely caused by meat eating. Another quotation. Flesh was never the best food, but its use is now doubtly objectable since diseases in animals are rapidly increasing. And if Sister White say this, more than a hundred years ago, have mercy. Have mercy upon us, Lord. The things that they are doing with the animals that were supposed to eat grass, green, green grass. Animals are now made to be cannibals. Flesh is being mixed with wheat to feed our cattle, our livestock. Antibiotics are used to treat the diseases within the animals. And if we eat these animals consistently, when we are taking antibiotics for our sicknesses, they are what is called resistant strains of these organisms will develop and make none and void the effect of the antibiotics. Today, both plants and animals are being genetically modified. You know what that means? That the very, a matter of fact, there is a tomato variety that they have taken a gene from the fish and placed in the tomato. There is a corn variety that they have taken a gene from a bacterium and placed within the corn. So if Sister White had written over a hundred years ago, have mercy. In regions in the world where people have made a deliberate effort to eat plant-based diet, they experience longer life than the general population. In Loma Linda, in California, in India, some places in India, in some places in Japan, in China, where persons have made a concerted effort to use plant-based diet, they have lived longer with less health issues. A matter of fact, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are only allowed to eat clean meat, and the Seventh-day Adventist population is at least five years more than the normal population. Flesh was never the best food, but if its use now is doubt, doubtly objectable, since diseases in animals are rapidly increasing. One man says the next pandemic will be bird flu. 
And it's not because we have the bird in our environment why we'll be catching bird flu. It's because we are eating birds. When I ask Google, what are the advantages of a plant-based diet? I've listed 10 of what Google has submitted. One, reduce inflammation. Many of the diseases that we have is a result of inflammation. Two, better digestive health. When our digestive system is working well, then our body will be what? Properly nourished. Three, reduce the risk of cancer. Four, weight management. So all these big bellies and overweight. Weight management. Five, reduce cardiovascular diseases. Six, diabetes. Reduce the carbon footprint. You know what is the carbon footprint? Let me explain quickly. We have what we call <clears throat> gases like methane, propane, that we use regularly in industry and our homes. All right, when these burn, all right, the, uh, um, the carbon dioxide is formed. A lot of industries, you have a lot of carbon dioxide formed. And carbon dioxide, as good as it is to the plant, it is not good for us and good for the general environment. Or too much that is. So if there's too much carbon dioxide forming, then of course it will create what is known as the greenhouse effect, which is resulting in many of the climate changes that we are seeing. All right? Another day I will do a presentation on that. All right? But suffice to say that when we eat less plant based um, food, we have less carbon in the environment. All right, they, they, I reach number seven. Number eight, it is more environmentally friendly. And that's where the carbon footprint is concerned. Number nine, it lowers cholesterol. A lot of the diseases that are affecting us is because of high cholesterol. And number 10, it gives us healthier hearts. Amen? The heart is what is responsible for the pumping and the, uh, of the blood. All right? And so with healthy heart, the blood can be properly pumped to the respective um, organs and places. My closing text is taken from 2 Corinthians 6 verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, said the Lord, and touch not the unclean things, and I shall receive you. Seventh-day Adventists, we are called out people. Amen? We are what? A called out people. We are a special people. And God has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he is saying to us that we must be what? Separate. We must not touch anything that is unclean. In summary, God wants us to go through a process of reformation and transformation. Amen? He says... If any man be in Christ, he is what? A new creature. He is a new creation. God wants us to be what? Transformed and reformed. Let's look at the lessons we learn from Israel in Egypt. One, baptism is required. Two, Sabbath reform. And three, health reform. And he says, but be not conformed to this world, but he be transformed by the renewing of the mind. My brothers and sisters, God has spoken to us. And if you feel impressed that what God has said to you has made an impact on your heart, I invite you to stand as we recommit our lives, as we commit ourselves. When Egypt shuns leave, so when the Israelites leave Egypt, only two persons stepped into the promised land. Only two persons stepped in the promised land that was originally with 
the multitude. Caleb and Joshua. Only two. We are in our wilderness experience. We are in spiritual Egypt. God has called us out of Egypt. He has unshattered us. He has set us free. He has liberated us. Let us not use what God has done for us. Let us use the opportunity to recommit, to reconnect, and to realign ourselves with his word. Because the Bible says, his word will go forth and will not return unto him void, but will accomplish his will. Somebody sing a song for me. A song of recommitment. A song of hope. A song to tell us that the new Jerusalem awaits us. But God wants us to be transformed by the renewing of the mind. baptized no doubt many of them had strayed from the past that they were walking but God is a repair of the bridge he is a restorer of the path to dwell in so perchance perchance is there somebody here who is not yet walking with the children of Israel. Perchance there's somebody lingering in Egypt. Lingering in Egypt. Because they have a liking for the Egyptian flesh. They have a liking for the Egyptian dance. Perchance somebody see the Israelites leaving. is an Israelite. God has called him. 
yet he's clinging on to the things of Egypt. Perchance, God wants everyone to be saved. For God so loved that he gave. He gave his only begotten son for each and every one of us. Perchance, somebody has not answered the call. Perchance, someone has not made his calling and his election sure. Perchance, I invite you to come to the altar as I will ask Elder Mattis to pray. Pray for those of us who are struggling. We are halting between two opinions. But I recall Joshua saying, and Elijah and Mount Carmel, if God be God, serve him. But if Baal be God, serve him. But I know I serve a risen Savior. The God who spoke and it was done. The God who commanded and it stood fast. The God of Moses. The God of Elijah. The God of Daniel. The God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. My brothers and sisters, you have heard the call. What will your hands be? God bless you. As we bow our heads in prayer. Righteous and eternal God. You would have bid us to come to your sanctuary. You would have created the opportunity for those who are online to be viewing this service. You would have prepared our ears unstopped so we could hear. You provided strength in our feet to walk to your sanctuary. And God, we have sat and we have listened to your voice. Through your man's servant. And today, Lord, we are once more reminded and charged as a witness that will be held against all of us that we need to make it right with you. Oh Lord, there are many in the hearing of my voice who have heard the call and are pondering which decision to make. It's possible, Lord, that there's someone that has not yet made their calling and election sure. There's someone who have not crossed over to say, Lord, I'm giving it all to you. And right now, Lord, they are pondering. Holy Spirit, rest upon them and help them to make that right decision for eternity. We pray, Lord, for every member of this church. We pray that we will not be walking in this pathway for years and years and at the end of it be a castaway. But God, we pray that you will envelop us in your bosom and that we will be safe and secure with you. We pray, Lord, that you will take charge of your man's servant and that you will be with him. Be with every worshiper here today. Help us, Lord, that our, our desire and our aspiration will be that we will make it into your everlasting kingdom. Until that day, Lord, keep us faithful. Until that day, may our hearts go on singing. Until that day when you shall come, we pray that you will help us to remain faithful to you in Jesus' name. Amen. May his peace be with you till we meet. Uh
Thank you for worshiping with us today. Those who have joined us in the sanctuary, those who are visiting with us for the first time, the second time, the third time, our regular visitors, our regular members, we want to thank you for joining us in worship today. Also, we want to thank those who have joined us online. We ask you that you will share the link and tell somebody of the Sydney platform, the 24 hours platform. Stay with us as we continue to lift up Jesus. We ask you to join us back this afternoon as we continue our Sabbath worship service. We will be back here at 3.30 for our Bible class and at 4.30 for our AY program. Vespers will close the activities of the day today. Tomorrow evening, we ask you to join us back where we'll be joining online, not in the center, online. We have a, a special present, presenter that will be presenting the message tomorrow night online on our online church. We will, the participants will be joined on Zoom and you will join on the YouTube platform. Remember also to for those who have not yet gotten on the platform, get on the platform so you can be a part of this great worship here at Sydenham. Enjoy your lunch and see you back at 3.30. Thank you.